party. But the big question is, in the next election, will that party bounce back? Now, a good comparison here is what happened to the Obama administration when it was elected in 2008 in a, in a major, uh, almost landslide level election. And in 2010, the, the Democrats took a big beating and then they rebounded in 2012. So the question is, will 2020 look, look like that? Or will 2020 look, look like what happened afterward, afterwards with the Obama administration? In 2014, the Obama administration and the Democrats took a big beating. And in 2016, they lost the White House. So the question is, will, will it look more like that? And will Trump and the Republicans be, the, be, be defeated? Now, the way the election was looking before the crisis is that it was, it was, it was looking, I think it was looking like it was going to be a close election because the Republicans took a beating in 2018. And from that, the Democrats were, were going to gain momentum. But on the other hand, the Trump administration had a lot of things going for it. In, two, in, in 2018 election, it was, it, it, was the, it was Congress that was at stake. In the 2020 election, it's, it's the White House, which is very different. The, tur the turnout dynamics are different and Trump up for re-election is different rather, rather than his party being up for, up for re-election. And he had a lot of things going for him. That is, he, 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 was, he was elected in a surprise election in 2016. Um, the Republicans came to control of, of the House and the Senate. So therefore, he was able to do a lot of things. And we, the, 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 there's a long story about how it all came about. But the bottom line was he enacted tax reform. He, he basically made judicial appointments, a lot of things that he promised. Deregulation, ending foreign agreements, the global climate agreement and also the Iran nuclear, nuclear agreement. So there are a lot of accomplishments that he could, he could point to, but the crown jewel of all these accomplishments was the strong economy uh, with a headwind going into the 2020 election. And that's the thing that, that's been up, up, up railed by the, by the virus. And that turns out to be, not surprisingly, a huge negative for the administration. And, it, and that negative has guided a lot of things that they've, that they've done in terms of playing down the, the crisis initially because of the, the kinds of economic consequences it could have. And for the moment, at least, the economy is not looking very good going into the 2020 election, which would give, give the Democrats an edge. On the other hand, there are just a lot of, there are a lot of other moving parts here and, and things that could work to the advantage of the Trump administration, or at least offsetting what's been, you know, what's likely to happen with, with, the, with the economy. And it has to do with how the coronavirus has derailed the current uh, presidential election in certain ways that could benefit the Trump administration. For one, we have a, a presidential crisis. Now, the common wisdom about all these crises is, and, and we've, 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 seen it, we've seen it discussed in the context of that, that one Gallup poll report that said his, his, that Trump's popularity rating uh, reached a high in the Gallup polls, the 49%. Now, the Gallup polls are important because Gallup was polling on presidential popularity beginning with the Roosevelt administration. So there's a big, the big, big history of this. So when the Gallup poll shows an uptick, that's, that's something very significant. And the expectation here is when these crises occur, what you have is a rally around the flag effect, that a crisis occurs and everyone automatically rallies around the president. Well, that rally around the president phenomenon is, uh, uh, is not quite so simple. The rally occurs because a crisis occurs and the public rallies around the president because political leaders, both Democrats and Republican leaders, rally around the president. And we, and we saw some of this. That is, there was the, that is what we've seen here, and it's quite extraordinary, is that the Democrats and Republicans got together without batting an eyelash and passed a $2.2 trillion economic recovery bill to deal with the crisis. Now, that's, that really is quite extraordinary. And that sends a signal of unity among leaders. And that has, that has a way of propelling the president's popularity. But only up to a point. That, that is my, my reaction to that Gallup poll report, uh, which suggested that his popularity rating went up from about 44% to 49%, a 5% uptick, was that that was, that was pretty small by historical standards. Usually, usually expect double, more than double digit, big double digit increases in presidential popularity. And, and the, re the reason for that actually has to do with two things. One, electoral alignments and, um, and partisan conflict. And, the, and the, the other part of it has to do with the fact that the public has, leaders have rallied around 
um, the president, so to speak, in terms of the Economic Recovery Act that's been, that's, that's been passed. But there's been substantial criticism of the way the president has handled the health crisis. And that's diminished the, the effect of the rally. That is, that's tempered the effect. There's been disagreement there at the level of political leaders. And uh, the public is only rallying so far. And, and the other reason the public's rallying only so far has to do with the following. Um, it used to be the case when these big rallies occurred that both Democrats and, and Republicans would kind of move in the same direction and rally around the president and also independents. What we saw here is that there wasn't really much of, much of an increase in, in public support, Republican support for the president because the, the Republicans have kind of maxed out their support. 95% of Republicans support the president. So there's no, there's, 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 there's no way that more Republicans can support the president because they're, they're just not there. Whereas, whereas independents and Democrats did increase their support of the president, but, but only, only to a certain degree. And the reason, the reason for that is it's been tempered by the criticism that the Trump administration has, has gotten. So the, 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 the rally hasn't been great. And also it's been limited. That is, if you look at, if you look at the latest data on that, it is, is, is that, it, it, that 49%, I would argue, is probably the peak. Trump is not going to go higher than that in the popularity rating. And, and, that's, and that's, that's going to temper things a lot. But the other thing working, working in, in his advantage here has to do with a phenomenon that we actually saw in the 2016 election. When Trump basically came on the scene with a big splash coming down that stairway in, in, in Trump Towers, he was able to dominate the media coverage of politics in a way that no politicians have, have readily been able to do. And what's happened with this, with, this, with this crisis is that the nature of the campaign has actually changed. Trump can't go out anymore and, and hold rallies that get a lot of media coverage. And by the same token, the Democratic candidates can't go out and hold rallies and, and campaign in the way, in the way, the way they've, done, they've done before. But Trump is, has done, in a sense, the functional equivalent of that in terms of dominating media coverage. That is, his, his daily press conferences, updates on the, on, the, on the coronavirus, has just dominated the news in a very big way. It's completely obscured what's happening on the Democratic Party side, with the exception of the state governors. That is, you've got Andrew, Andrew, Andrew Cuomo and other, other um, governors and even mayors, Democratic mayors, emerging on the, on the scene and getting a, a lot of visibility. But, but, but that's enabled him to kind of keep his campaign going, appeal to his, his base, um, in basically a way, a way he can do it without spending any money even. That is, that is, this, is this is all free media coverage of, uh, of, of the president. And each of these events is a, is a campaign where he can, you know, he can bash the media and criticize his, his opponents and, and do all of those uh, partic particular con kinds of things. And thus far, enough of that has happened to offset the possible negative consequences of the coronavirus and with what's happening in the economy. And, and, and even the state of the economy is up in the air. Today, today for example, the stock market closed and was up, was up about 8%. And that's showing a certain amount of confidence you know, with regard to the economy. So what the economy is going to look like you know, a few months from now is fully unclear. It's certainly not going to be doing as well as it, as it would have otherwise done. But, um, but it, it, may, you know, it may not hurt the president as much as, 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 much as the common wisdom would expect. We, 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 just, we really just don't know about it. Um, we just really don't know about this. And, by, and what, what Trump can do is claim credit for the economic stimulus package and all the things that he's, that he's doing. And by virtue of finally listening to the experts and so forth, he's, he, he's tr trying to show that he has a better command of, this, of the situation so that the criticism he, he received is, is blunted by his, um, his actions. But, but, but again, this is all unpredictable. The deal for him in order to deal with the economy, he's got to deal with the health crisis first, and that's and, and there's a long way to go, with with with, with regard to that. So in, in terms so in terms of you know where that leaves things, there's there are a lot of negatives at work for the Trump administration, but there's some positives as well. Things not positives in a, in an extremely positive sense, but a positive in the sense that he can offset, uh, in part, some of the negative consequences. Where I think. You know where, where this currently leaves the election is is where I think it looked after the 2018 midterm elections. That is, the Trump administration is, is scrambling to uh, defend itself, but it it had time to recover, much in the way that the Obama administration recovered after the in in, two, in 2012. And on top of all that, all this all this reference to national popularity ratings and the like is almost irrelevant. 
Um, in the, the way I, look, I've, I looked at the 2020 election in 2018 you know, is as follows. And I'm going I'm to I'm, I'm show, I'm gonna show the, the, uh, just some brief slides. Maps of the United States, which are the electoral college maps of the United States. Okay, let's see. Okay, now uh, I, have, I have a few slides here, and th this is the way I look at the elections. Uh, because of the transformation that's occurred in American politics, the increase in partisan conflict, and the geography of American elections, we have both political parties competitive for both the presidency and the House and the Senate. And because of the electoral geography, um, you know, we, we've had in recent years two presidential elections where the president won the popular vote but lost the electoral vote. So the name of the game is the electoral vote. So all what, what I've talked about thus far in terms of national polls and popularity ratings and what the, what the national picture looks like uh, is kind of moot because what matters is, what, is, is what's happening on the, the electoral map concerning the states. And there, you know, we have solid Democratic states, blue states. We have solid Republican states, red states. And then we have a certain number of swing states, and that's the election. And how, that, and how the corona crisis, um, virus um, crisis will affect that is, is, is unclear. A lot may hinge on how those individual states are affected by the crisis in terms of health, the health costs, loss of lives, and how the state economies are affected by them. And what, what, I, what I just want to close with, close with here is the electoral map, and the electoral map kind of summarizes what's happened in recent American politics. Okay, so we have, we have the, uh, the, the rules are the candidate who wins the election is the one who has a majority of the electoral votes. So a candidate needs 270 of the two, 538 electoral votes to win the election. Popular vote is completely irrelevant. The, uh, what happened in the 2016 election, uh, the metaphor here is that the blue wall crumbled. Uh, I don't know if it, you've, you've all given thought as to what the blue wall means. Um, and let me, let me give you some idea what the blue wall means or the blue walls mean here. Okay, let's, let's look at the 1992 election. This was a, this, what's, what's very interesting about this is that Bill Clinton won the presidency in 1992 right after George Herbert Walker Bush was a highly successful president in winning the Gulf War. The Gulf War was a national crisis. The rally around the flag effect that occurred during the Gulf War was not a presidency, who's a president whose popularity went up to 49%. This is a president whose popularity uh, skyrocketed to the range of 90%. Okay, we're talking about an extraordinarily popular president. All of that disappeared by 1992, much in the way as the war hero with Winston Churchill um, in, in World War II, uh, and ended the war on a high on a high note, defeating the Nazis. Uh, was a very popular leader, and his reward for that was to be defeated in the next election because of the domestic problems that that followed in terms of the economy and healthcare in Britain. Anyway, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a brief aside, but that that just tells you something about how how things would change. Now, notice here. Look at all the blue states. You've got all these blue states, and the thing that's very unusual here is that Bill Clinton. I've got my little arrow here running around here, actually won a number of Southern states, Arkansas, his state, Louisiana, Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, um, Missouri, and so forth. Uh, these states are, are states that, never, that have not gone back to the Democrats uh, systematically since then. And notice as well, Virginia was, is, a, is, a, is a red state here. Uh, states don't take note of Colorado was, became a blue state, New Mexico, Nevada. Uh, the, the blue wall, as I see it back then, is the West Coast Wall, and then there's the East Coast Wall, and then there's the Midwest Wall right here, and then there's, a, uh, some, there's sort of an extended Eastern Wall or Midwest Wall in here. But Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin are solidly Democratic states. And then, we'll, we'll, and, and then he won Ohio, and he, lo he lost Indiana. Uh, he lost Florida, by the way, that's, a, that's a, and, but won Georgia. 1996, pretty similar. Uh, Clinton wins, wins a second term. Um, he's on the verge of, verge of being in, impeached. Um, and again, there, um, he lost some of the southern states, but he, but he maintained Arkansas, Louisiana, Tennessee, and he, and he wins Florida at that time as well. Uh, Virginia is still a red state. Arizona, he wins Arizona. That's, that's, that's 
whether that's a new blue wall or not is, is up in the air. And then he wins Iowa and Missouri as, as well. Okay. During this period, a process of political partisan polarization is occurring by which the, the South is being transformed into a major part or the major part, if you will, of the Republican coalition. The 2000 election, this is the, this is the big controversial election. Gore wins the popular vote. He loses the electoral vote. The South is completely Republican during this period, quite systematically. Nevada is, is no longer democratic for the, for the moment. New Mexico is democratic. Iowa is democratic. Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania are democratic. Ohio is, is Republican and so forth. Now, the striking thing here, everybody talks about how Florida was crucial, the hanging chads and all, and all of that stuff. Well, Gore would have won the election without Florida had he been able to take Tennessee, his home state, or Nevada, or uh, New Hampshire. Okay. Now, this, this map here is a, is a very good representation of the nature of partisan conflict and the closeness of American elections. Every, this, 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 this is the basic competition between the parties and everything um, that happens subsequent to this year hinges on what happens to, to certain competitive states. 2004, the, the map is pretty similar. Um, uh, Bush picks up, um, um, picks up New Mexico, it picks up Iowa. There's some states that, that become Republican. In 2008, Obama wins. Okay, so this is the Obama map right here. Now the big change, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip back here. Colorado and Virginia are Republican. After this election, Colorado and Virginia become solidly Democratic. This is, this is very important. So we flip to 2008, Obama wins very handily picks up Colorado, Virginia, Nevada, New Mexico, Iowa, and then the entire, all the, all the East Coast states, and of course the, the, nor the Northern Wall here. And he wins, he wins now the, thing, the surprise is he wins Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, and Indiana. He makes inroads on Republican, on Republican states here. 2012, loses Indiana and North Carolina, still wins the election because he, win he wins Florida. But remember now, but Colorado, Virginia, New Mexico, Nevada, Iowa are, dem are Democratic and, and New Hampshire. Two th now we jump to 2016. And this, this, is, this, this, this is where we, we see a, 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 the extraordinary change that it, that's occurred. The Democrats lose Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. They lost Florida, they lost Ohio, and so forth. They would have won this election had they won Wisconsin, Michigan, and, Pen and Pennsylvania. They, they, the Democrats don't need Florida. They don't need North Carolina. They don't need Ohio. The reason for that is they, they, they now solidly have Nevada, New Mexico, Colorado, and Virginia. They lost Iowa. They don't need, they don't need Iowa. They just need those three states. Uh, before the... Before the, the virus occurred, the Democrats needed these three states. After the virus occurred, the Democrats need these three states. These are the battleground states. My prediction after the 2018 election was that, that, was that I thought the Democrats had a very good chance of winning the 2020 election. They lost those states, Michigan, Michigan Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, by a grand total of 90,000 votes. In 2016, um, they lost those states because African-American vote was down. Barack Obama was no longer, was no longer on, the, on the ticket. Obama voters and, and others, white working, the white working class voters, it's white voters without a college degree, shifted and voted, and voted Republican. To make up those 90,000 votes, all the Democrats need is a, is a combination of some disgruntled Trump supporters not voting for him in 2020, having voted for him in 2016, or the Democrats better mobilizing those voters in 2020. That was the situation before the virus. I see that situation existing now. If you look at the national polls, the national polls show that Biden, if he were the candidate, would be ahead. He would be ahead in some of these swing states as well, but by, but by very little. I th I'd say the Democrats are pretty confident at this point in winning the popular vote in the 2020 election. But the name of the game is what happens in, 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 the, in, in those states and, and what the consequences of the virus are for those states is 
up for grabs at this point. And I think, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna stop there. There, 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 there. there are questions people might have about uh, various political responses to the virus and how the, 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 the governors of states and, and local leaders have, have kind of uh, pick, picked up the mantle and tried to deal with the problem and that, that might have certain elect, electoral consequences. But I think there I'll stop for questions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Bob, we will open it up for questions. Uh, again, there is a hand you can raise now, I don't see any hands raised yet, but I'm going to, um, Tom? Uh, I can maybe start if you want while you wait, while you feel the rest of the questions. Thank you very much, Bob, and everyone for joining us today. That's very interesting, Bob, uh, it, it, uh, and very concise. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, uh, the emphasis has been on Electoral College. Could you talk a little bit about the candidates? You've said relatively little of Biden versus Sanders, but yeah. yeah. Biden and maybe, yeah, because I won't get another chance. Maybe I, you didn't mention anything about Barack Obama. Uh, maybe okay. just talk about those three people and how you see them okay. playing in to this scenario in the Electoral College. Yeah, the, the, the missing part of my discussion, and you, and you, you picked up on it, and thank you for doing that, is that I didn't, um, I, I, I asserted at the end that the, all the Democrats had to do with, was to make up 90,000 votes in those three states. Well, that's a big if, and it, 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 that is, that, that it's very difficult to target votes in, in particular states without really campaigning, doing the same thing to appeal to those kinds of voters nationwide. The problem for the Democrats in 2016 is that the party wasn't fully unified around their candidate. Now, part of it had to do with the fact that um, there was a big anti-Hillary element within the party, and, all, and also obviously outside, outside the party as, as well. And a lot of Sanders' support came from anti-Hillary voters. Um, and, and that's no longer a dynamic because Hillary's no, Hillary Clinton is no, is no longer the candidate. But everything really hinges on, on the Democrats being united here. And what it really hinges especially on is how Bernie Sanders handles the situation. That is, that, that, that at, at this particular juncture, it looks like Biden would get the nomination if the elections play out. That is the problem at the moment is all of these primary, most of the primary elections are being postponed right now. So we don't, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, Biden is ahead in, term, in terms of delegates. If he continues the way he's doing, he's going to handily get, handily get a majority of delegates by the time um, of the first ballot of, of the of, 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 of the convention, but at, but at this juncture, I, uh, the, the the key thing is is that Trump has been able to dominate uh, political discourse in the United States. His his press conferences are ones that, that that deal with the virus, but they're they're also his his part of his part of his campaign. Biden has been very invisible, and as Biden himself pointed out, one of the reasons he's you know one disadvantage he has is he's not even a senator at this point in time. If he were a senator at this point in time, he'd have a, he'd have a a, um, a policy making vantage point to speak from. But now he's just a, pol a political candidate comparing competing for airtime. He's basically st he's stuck at home. He he. he He's been delayed in setting up his uh, his uh, media operation at home, his cameras and and uh, and, and so forth. And you know, at, at, at this juncture, he's he's at a disadvantage. Now that's going to end pretty soon, uh, um, at some point. What what has to happen next is that is that the Democrats will have to get united around their candidate and convince their ba their base that the most important thing is to defeat Donald Trump. And if they can they can do that, they can win. They can they can pick up the the electoral votes they need. And if they really did that in a serious way, they could, they could turn this election, not necessarily into a landslide, but enough of a victory by, by which they can not only win the presidency, but, but maintain control of the House and also take control of the Senate, which would put them in a very good position to undo a lot of the things that the Trump administration has done. But that, but that, that, is, that is really a very big if at this, at this point. I don't know if that fully answered your question. A quick word to you about Barack Obama. Oh, well, Barack Obama at this point, well, um, things have changed a, a little bit since Biden was, was able to take the lead in, in the primaries and, and uh, uh, build momentum toward getting a, a majority of delegates. O Obama is in, a, is in a position, well, he was in a position to do two things. If, if the Democrats um, had reached the convention without a, without a candidate having a majority of, of the delegates on the first ballot, he, he, would, be, he would have been in, in a position to be the elder state, statesman in the party, even though he's not that old, to help, you know, negotiate who the candidate could be. At this juncture, he's 
he and Michelle Obama are potentially big ralliers in terms of mobilizing the Democratic base in the, in the next election. But again, that's going to hinge on the base being you know, ready to be, uh, to be unified. And I think the key player there is Bernie Sanders and how he handles his, his supporters. Thank you. There are a lot of questions here in the chat. I don't know if uh, uh, anybody wants to uh, do them personally or just read them to you, or you can see them there, Bob. Um, let me just... Let's see. Um... Do you have any hand up? Right okay, well, okay, there's one question. So you mentioned you would, you would argue 49% is the greatest support Trump can count on. Okay. Can you please elaborate? Okay, let, okay, I've been following all of the presidential popularity data since Trump has been, has been elected. Um, the, 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 re, the reason that, that that's probably the maximum is that, rep, that, that 49% consists heavily of 95% of Republicans. The Democrats, the, the, the degree of conflict between the parties is such is that there, there's basically no way, shape, or form that a large number of Democrats are going to are going to are going to approve of, of Trump's performance as pre, as president. Um, they, they, he's done a whole lot of things they they dislike. They're very bitter about what happened in two, in two, in 2016. Um, and in the context of current politics, any anything anything that Trump does is going to, um, is going to be readily a subject for criticism by by Democratic leaders and the Democratic leaders just by virtue of, of uh, criticizing Trump will basically at minimum confuse, confuse things sufficiently that these democratic supporters aren't gonna, aren't gonna shift toward Trump. And in the independents, the independent voters are actually of two sorts. A third of the independents are really Democrats in disguise. A third are really Republicans in disguise. And they're about, and they're about a third who are purely independent, but those independents tend to be less active and engaged in politics. And I don't, I don't, and for that reason, I don't see that 49% getting much higher. It could, it could, it could reach 50, but I don't, much more than that, I find, un, I find it unlikely unless the current health situation, economic situation um, turns around so substantially that uh, everyone sees benefit to Trump remaining in office. Well, there's another question in the chat. Um... I think everybody can. What, what, there's one, what, what impact will the bailout have on the American perception okay. of Trump, specifically the fact that some, some funding will be directly uh, deposited to voters? Yeah, I think, I think those, those things that the Trump administration does, I think fully explains why a lot of Democrats, you know, some Democrats and independents have been re reacting favorably to what Trump has, has been doing. But the big question is, is that will they react favorably enough to, to vote for him in the next election? Uh, or are they simply acknowledging the uh, the positive aspects of the funding? And of course, the funding here it, this this wasn't Trump. This was this this was basically Nancy Pelosi and Mnuchin, you know, doing this. And this was a bipartisan effort that that Trump, in the end, all he had to do was sign on the dotted line. This wasn't something he put together himself. Uh, there's a question: Which groups in the battleground states need to turn out for the Democratic nominee to win? What factors would encourage or discourage their participation? I think the, the I think the the, cru the crucial voters and the ones who were who were less active in 2016 were um, African American voters and young adult voters and and, and the, the young adult voters were a lot of a lot of whom at least people in that category were voters who supported Sanders who weren't very happy about having Hillary Clinton as the nominee and those voters may not be very happy about Biden either and that's why that's why Sanders um, you know San what, what Sanders says and does to help engage them is, 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 is very important. And then the other important group in the 2018 election especially were, you know, a, a lot of whom were women voters, particularly middle-class women voters in key, in key states who made, who made a huge difference. And, and th those, are, those are probably voters who can be counted on to, uh, uh, to, to stick with the Democrats and vote for Biden in the next election. But, but the key groups and who could make a difference in those three states are young voters and African-American voters. And then the other group that's important among Sanders supporters the one big surprise in the current uh, primaries was was the extent of Sanders' support among among um, Latin uh, Latino voters in the United States, and it's those it's those voters who need to come out um, and, and and to the same degree in support of Biden as they've been supporting Sanders in the in the primaries and caucuses that have occurred thus far. Um, have you factored increasing voter suppression tactics dur during and since 2016? Uh, such as interstate cross-check, geo, geo paid states, programming machines to give, to give fractional votes, et cetera. Well, the, the, with regard to 
the voter suppression. I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned. I'd be less concerned about the technology and more concerned about the voter, voter registration requirements, voter ID requirements, and how people working at the polling places uh, basically implement and handle these, these, these kinds of things. Um, and also on top of that, and we saw this in the primaries already, the kind of suppression and discouraging of voters that can occur simply by long lines at the polls. And what was, what was striking during, the, during some of the recent primaries is, is that, that a lot of voters were willing to spend you know, long hours online to wait for, you know, to, to wait for, to wait for their chance to vote. But it's, th it's those kinds of things um, that, 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 we, that, we, that we need to watch for. We haven't seen any, um, any, of this, any of this kind of suppression occurring in a, in, in, in a, in a systematic way to make, you know, make a substantial difference in the election. There are debates about how much that played a role in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. But the problem there is that there, there were a lot of other factors that contributed to what happened there. The voters were just, you know, weren't as, weren't as excited about Hillary Clinton as they were about um, uh, Barack Obama. And, and, and that in and of itself made, you know, made a difference. And also, also how the candidates campaigned, uh, the, the Trump campaign did better in campaigning in those states than the Democrats did and how that could have made a difference. And then on that added, added all to that was basically just the, the Comey revelations, of, uh, the, the repeated Comey revelations regarding Hillary's email that had negative effects. So there were a lot, a lot of other things at work that make it difficult to, to argue that it was voter suppression that made the singular difference. And certainly not, and certainly not the Russians making a difference in those places. There's a question here about uh, the situation in the UK where Boris Johnson uh, is uh, in the hospital today with COVID-19. Uh, COVID uh, what if any of the candidates, either Trump, Biden, or the candidates for vice, vice president gets ill? Well, it, uh, two things. W one is um, just, an well, it, it's that in conjunction with some of these candidates being um, older and, and perhaps more vulnerable to, to, well, not not just to, not just to the virus, but just to um, health consequences of, by virtue by virtue of old age. The, I mean, the one consequence here uh, is obviously that the, the choice of vice president becomes more important because that vice president could well wind up serving as president. Um, also, the vice president, even you know, irres regardless of the president's health, whoever gets picked as vice president uh, will have a big advantage in the next open seat in the White House in terms of being the next presidential candidate. So that makes, that, that makes, that makes a very, very big difference. With regard to handling um, that basically presidents becoming ill or even dying, you know, we, we have constitu constitutional provisions that, that, that handle that. Um, there, 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 there have been amendments to the constitution that deal with that, that allow for presidential succession. Uh, so, so, that's, so that's covered. So I think the bigger factor is, is the the selection of these people to begin with. And then of course, there's the, there's the strategic calculation that comes in. Who should Biden pick as his vice president to help oh, mobilize help mobilize voters? I mean, the obvious things about him nominating a woman, a person of color, or a woman and a person of color in the same, in the same person. Uh, those, kind, th those kinds of things come into play as, as well. But, but, you, but typically the vice presidential candidate is less important. Although in, in, this, in this particular race, it could be, it could be more important. Any any names that you would bet on? Well, I mean, the, the, our, I mean, the names everyone's talking about are, are uh, Kamala Harris and and and, St and Stacey Abrams and Amy Klobuchar, uh, sort of leading ones. And then there are, and then of course there are other Republican governors, like Gretchen, you know, um, uh, um, Gretchen Whitmer and you know Andrew Cuomo, who've kind of emerged. Um, in this context. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't give Cuomo much uh, much of a chance of being the vice presidential pres presidential nominee. Given the pressure to diversify the uh, the ticket, so I follow up on that because I posed the question, but my question was more targeted towards a, on a scenario where, where Trump is not running because he he may die, or or, or either of, of the of the Democratic candidates. So, how open would would that make the, the election? Oh, okay, so that's a good question. Okay, so in tr in terms of Trump not running, the scenario there is that. Obviously, Pence is the person who's in, who's who's in the in the best position to kind of claim that he's the he's the heir, so to speak, to Trump. On the on, you know, on the other hand, there are other Republicans out there who who who've, who've had an idea about um, being po possible presidential candidates sooner rather than later. And I think first and foremost among that group is Nikki Haley, 
uh, who was in the Trump administration and, and, and has been a pretty, a pretty good soldier for Trump. Uh, so to speak. With, uh, now, you, what, what was your question about the, about the Democrats and, and dying and so forth? Yeah, no, no, exactly. What if Sanders may not end, end the race because he, he may get sick even before the nomination, or, or Biden being selected as candidate but not being able to run for president because he gets sick in the, in the process? Yeah, so that's what, a good point. What okay. would happen in that scenario? Yes. Okay, a lot, a lot depends on the timing. A lot depends on the timing of that. Um, and the timing has to do has to do with the occurrence of the the, the Democratic National Convention. Um, sa sa that that question isn't is not so relevant. Well, assuming Biden is, good, if the if the primary elections are held on schedule, the expectation is that is that bride, Biden will have a majority of the um, will have a majority of the delegates. If if something were happen were to happen to Biden. Um, if, if he were to get sick or, 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 or whatever. Technically speaking, his delegates are still committed to vote for him. Um, if, 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 he, if, 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 he were to, if, if he were to die, I haven't looked at this, but, but uh, the question is, are there provisions in the Democratic Party rules with regard to what, uh, what to do if that situation happens? Certainly if that situation happens, the Democratic Party uh, would, would, would have legitimacy in basically coming up with a change in rules with regard to how to, how to, how to, how to deal with that. I mean, one way, one way to deal with that is to have all, all the delegates vote, vote for the, uh, uh, the, the candidate that they're, they're committed for on the first ballot. If, if Biden were to get sick, not die, they could vote for him on, on, the, uh, on, on, on the first ballot. If he were, were then to withdraw, the Democratic, the Democratic Party would have to make a revision for, for re-voting at the convention. And then the other scenario, of course, is that if it, 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 it's still conceivable that none, that none of the two candidates could get a majority of delegates on the first ballot because there are 169 delegates that are committed to the candidates who've dropped out. Those, the, those delegates could still vote for those candidates uh, in a scenario by which um, that would lead to no candidate getting a majority. And then on the second ballot at the convention, all the, all the delegates are free to vote for whomever they want. Plus, we have super delegates who get to weigh in during the second ballot at the convention. I see no questions, no hands raised. I, re I, I remind you that, you, that, in, that down in your screen, you can raise your hand if you want to ask a question personally, but there are some questions in the chat group also. Uh, okay, there's, a, there's, a, there's a question, um, yeah. How might the crisis affect actual voting and congressional action to increase mail and alter, alter, alternative ways of voting? Okay, so we, we've, we've already seen that the, um, well, the state of Wisconsin basically you know, canceled its, its election tomorrow, and the governor wants to move to, to mail voting. Uh, P President Trump has an, announced that he completely opposes uh, mail voting. Uh, the decision to have voting by mail is not, a, is not a decision of the national government, it's a decision of the states. They, they, get, they get to decide how they, want, how they want to run those elections. And if the, uh, you know, if the virus situation doesn't, doesn't improve and there, there, there are dangers, uh, obviously, throughout the primaries, the primaries will will, will shift to, to uh, are likely to shift to mail voting, and then the big question is what will happen in, in the general election. Um, the uh, and 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 there it's it's a, it's a question of of each state making its own decision with regard to uh, how, how to deal with it, with Trump on record of opposing it. Now, the big question, of course, is does mail voting advantage one party over the other? Now the common wisdom here is that anything that makes voting easier benefits, the, you know, would, would, would tend to benefit the Democrat, who seem to be most affected by voter, voter restriction rules and the like. I'm not quite, sh I'm not quite so sure about that. Is that that is there are there, there are a lot of, of voters who are not necessarily Democrats who might be more likely to vote if if, if, it, if it became easier in in that way. The one thing we do know for sure is that while the states can can, can delay the holding of primary elections. Um, Constitutionally, uh, we, we have to have a new president by um, by January 20th and a new Congress by January um, 3rd, and so the election has to be held sometime you know before then. Um, and uh, with that worst uh, situation occurring, by which the the the, uh, the 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 general election gets delayed a little bit, but it can't be delayed too much. Uh, let's see. There's a question. Although I understand Trump can't cancel the election, 
uh, there is practical impediment to holding a national election if things don't improve from here to November. How do you see elections being held in the context of social distancing? Yeah, they, they, it, would, it would be done by mail or taking, or basically taking the chances of having an election where, where people wait online to vote at the, the voting place. Do you feel that Trump impeachment will be, will be a factor? Uh, certainly Trump will, will try to make that a, um, an, 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 an election issue. Uh, certainly the impeachment of Bill Clinton didn't, didn't hurt him as he left office or, or well, it didn't, well, it didn't hurt him or his party in the 1998 midterm elections, but it, but it did hurt uh, his, his party in the 2000 election in, in that um, Clinton could not campaign as, as vigorously he, as he might have otherwise had he not been impeached. I wonder if the questioner here, Bob, is also asking about whether his handling of the crisis might be grounds for impeachment. Uh, no, well, his, well, his handling of the crisis would not would be would be grounds for impeachment on, only if, if one could look one could argue that he he basically violated a law or committed some kind of high crime or, or misdemeanor. Incompetence is not grounds for impeachment. Incompetence is grounds for not being reelected. Can you talk a little bit about the governor's role? We've seen Governor Cuomo uh, very active and, and have a national, acquiring a national profile and several other ones. Um, yeah, well, well, well something I mean, new that, that's happened, at least that I've seen in, in U.S. politics in the recent times. That, 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 that's, that's happened before. I mean, the, what, what happens is when, hap when things happen in certain locations, it's, it's the local leaders who have the responsibility and the, uh, and the power to uh, act forcefully to, to, to deal with them. We actually saw that on 9-11, where for a brief moment, Ru Rudolph Giuliani became the nation's mayor. Uh, while George Bush was kind of uh, regrouping and uh, uh, determining how he was going to respond as president to the to the to the, to the 9/11 crisis, and it's it's certainly it's, it's certainly been an opportunity for the gov the governors to, to take a leadership role. But I think it's I, but I think it's one that was was I think you know in itself less directly political and more and more directly uh, having to do with their responsibilities as you know as governor. I mean, Cuomo is not worrying worried about being reelected. Um, Phil de, uh, Bill de Blasio is not worrying about re, being re, you know, reelected, but they're worried about making, you know, making sure that their, that their states and, and cities get, get, get saved. Now, of course, there are, there are political ambitions that they have that may come into play here as well. But I think, uh, I think the crisis itself, uh, you know, uh, I think the crisis itself leads me to be less cynical about the behavior of those political leaders. I think there, there are more questions here uh, in the chat room. The last one, I don't know if you can read, you, you can see it, uh, Bob. In the context of the emergency, how would Trump's refusal to recognize election results play out? For example, if he does not recognize votes delivered by ma by mail. Well, that, well, I mean, well, it's it's an, it's it's an interesting question. You have to keep in mind here that these decisions about how to hold local, state how to hold the elections is is determined by the states. The majority of the states are controlled by Republicans. And and and, um, and that that in and of itself lends some legitimacy to what the what, what the states are doing because you, you have Republican and Democratic governors making these particular kinds of kinds of decisions. Uh, I, I I think in, in terms of what power you know what power Trump has to not recognize votes um, is pretty is pretty limited. Think about what 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 he could do. He can can he can he refuse to leave office? The, that he would be violating the Constitution if he did that. And federal law. Now, while we wait for another question, I wonder if you might talk to us a little bit about how women should look upon these, this whole the Democratic primary process where many women candidates, uh, there was a woman nominated in 2016, but this year women didn't fare very well. Elizabeth Warren faded quickly, some say unfairly. What, what's your take uh, on the, the, the national electorate or the Democratic electorate about the role of women seeking the highest office? Well, the, well, the simple fact that we haven't had a we have we haven't had a woman president or vice president tell, tells tells you something about um, political inequality in the United in the in, in the in the United States, um, and I, I think that's pretty good you know prima prima, prima facie evidence of, of something so to speak. I think in I think in this current election the the, the thing the thing that hurt um, minority candidates and women 
was simply the sheer number. You know, we, 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 there were collectively over the course of the election, there were, there were on the order of 28 candidates running for president. And that divided, and that was just dividing up the, of, of the, the vote in such, in such a way that made it difficult for any one person to emerge, which, which you know, might simply give an advantage to a, uh, a more established white male political figure or, 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 or a more established radical white male political figure. And that, and we, as to why, you know, Sanders and Biden, Biden, you know, leaped ahead. And, and it may have just been idiot, idiosyncratic um, to that. It is, it is, it is surprising though that Warren, that Warren, Warren faded uh, as quickly as she did toward, toward the end. Any other questions, comments? What about the bad, let's go back to the battleground states. Uh, you mentioned three of them. What's your predictions about all these? The, the, they're, 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 oh, or it's too early to... Yeah, well, it, yes, it's too early to tell. It's hard to predict. The latest polls have, have um, and the, the, the latest polls, which are old polls, they're not, they're not very recent. Um, and also in these states, there tend to be fewer state polls than, than national polls. Those, those latest polls had, had Biden ahead by, by a few points. The problem there is that th those, those numbers are, are way too early. They have lots of error. We don't know, we don't know who's actually going to vote on election day. And a lot depends on the uh, motivation of these, of these voters to vote. All we know is that, they're gonna, that, 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 is that neither candidate looks like will win those states in, in any kind of landslide. That is, it's, it's, it's just simply very close and too close to determine. Even though we, even though I think we, I think there's, I think it's an easy prediction that the Democrats will win the popular vote nationally again. There are a couple of new questions here in the chat room. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to reverse the polarization in U.S. politics? Political scientists, including myself, have have have, lo have lost a lot of hair, kind of. Uh, Think, you know, think, thinking about thinking about that question, the, pro the problem the, the, the problem is is that the, the partisan conflict is is really very deep. That is that is we, we we would have a very high level of conflict and polarization even if Trump had not won the election. If Hillary if Hillary had won the election, it would have been at a high level but of a different sort. Um, and if 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 another Republican had won, like Ted Cruz, uh, or, or or one of the other candidates, we we would have still had a high high degree of polarization. In terms of the kind, you know, the, the, the first and foremost, I mean, the, 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 the thing that could most likely diminish polarization is a national crisis where the nation had to come together. And we're in the middle of that right now. And we can ask the question, is, is there something our political leaders have done in handling this crisis that could have done, that, that could have led to more, you know, more reconciliation? I think, you know, I've I think it's pretty it's pretty easy to say that Trump Trump could have toned down his rhetoric a little bit and been a little more thick-skinned to criticism he's received. Mike Pence, on the other hand, seems to be more deliberative and contemplative in terms of dealing with it, dealing with dealing with criticism with criticism. Uh, but on the other hand, after 9/11, there was a, there was a there was a brief period of national unity and then then things returned to uh, uh, to the normal state of of conflict. In terms of other things that could that could happen, I mean, the political scientists have proposed all kinds of changes in rules that could that could lead to um, the moderation of of made moderation of politics um, easing voter making voting easier might lead to more moderate voters coming out to vote and that might that might moderate politics uh, a third party that might emerge in the middle to reconcile things somebody like Bloomberg emerging the problem with the third party is is that you know we, we have third party presidential candidates but to have a real third party requires having that kind of moderate party, not just running for president, but running for every, you know, level of office in the country. We don't have a we don't have a thirty a party like that. Ross Perot ran, you know, got a lot of votes in the in the 1992 election. He got 19 percent of the vote. That's enormous for a third party. But he got 19 percent of the vote in every state, and he didn't didn't win any electoral votes. So that 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 would be good. that would be out of the picture. Other possibilities. I mean, the, 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 you know, some combination of you know the, the media amplifying conflict. If we re reinstated the fairness rule, that that, that could that could in some ways moderate uh, the kind of uh, conflict that occurs in media coverage of issues and and commentate commentary and things of, and thing, 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 things of that sort. Um, term limiting con term limiting um, political candidates. That 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 is 
get rid of the current conflict-ridden candidates and replace them with other candidates and political leaders, well, that might just lead to current, you know, current politicians being replaced by people who are just like them with the same level of, same level of uh, political conflict. And then the other, then the one other thing, takes takes a longer period of time. If you if you can't, re if you, you if, if you if leaders don't change, then the only thing we might be left with is is the people changing. And, but the people by people changing, I mean literally changing the people in terms of of replacing the current population with with the next generation of citizens and leaders in the United States or immigrant groups and, and the like. And, but, the, but those kinds of things take a, a, a great deal of time and there's nothing to stop those people from being, from being socialized into, into the same kind of conflict ridden political environment um, as everyone else has been. So I'm not, I'm not quickly optimistic about it, but, but the, the idea of statesmen emerging in a national crisis, that, that has some resonance to it, but we haven't seen it yet. And I, I mean, statesmen on both sides, by the way, that's the problem. Or states women. That's right. <laughs> That's right. My states women. At this point, we have to say state person. And Tom, do you have any comment before we close, uh, we reach the time? Oh, but before we thank Bob, and uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, it, it just, Bob, you could just talk a little bit about the conservative movement in the United States, the right wing conservative movement in the United States. Uh, a lot of the conservative support for Trump was a small government, a limited role for the government. And uh, all of a sudden you've had these mega packages going through, huge interventions, government literally taking over private companies. Has that bulwark of the Republican of support for uh, Trump uh, gone away or is that going to reassemble? Mm. That, 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 that. That's a very good question, and, and, and it's interesting to talk about a conservative movement because um, usually you think of the conservative movement and the Republican Party in, this, in the same breath, so to speak. The problem at this point is the Republican Party is not that Republican Party. That Republican Party is the Trump Party right now, and that Trump Party has support from the, you know, at least the religious conservative base of the party because, because they want certain kinds of things which, which he's been able to deliver, i.e., you know, Supreme Court conservative Supreme Court judges uh, uh, to deal with issues like abortion, gay rights, and the, you know, and, and, and the, and, and the, and the like. Uh, I think there's a bit, basically the conservative movement is, is split at the moment. And the big question is, is that what, what will, what will the Republican party look like if Trump loses in 2020, or what will it look like when the, uh, uh, when the 2024 election occurs and Trump will be, will disappear from the scene unless Trump is able to take over the party and produce a, um, a party that nominates a leader that's just basically, you know, a younger version of Donald Trump. Well, on that note, I want, to, <laughs> I want to thank you, Bob, for your time. And I want to thank everybody who participated in the call. This is the first uh, of many uh, webinars we will be holding as Columbia Global Centers in the next few weeks. So stay tuned. Thanks uh, to Tom again. And um, stay safe. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you, Bob. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.